31, and we're continuing our chapter by chapter, verse by verse study, and I would normally say through Proverbs, but through the Old Testament, we're in the very last chapter of Proverbs, and we're in the last section of Proverbs too. You remember it was divided up into five different sections, and this uh, chapter from King Lemuel uh, is the very last chapter of the book, and as always, I'd hope to cover the entire book, but somehow I don't think we're going to get through it because maybe I talk too much, but mm -hmm. I find it fascinating, the things that are in here. So uh, these are the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy or the utterance which his mother taught him. So uh, my first question is, who's Lemuel? Anybody know? Lot, lots of guesses about who it might be, but nobody knows for sure. Nobody can prove it. Uh, He's evidently not a king of Israel, or at least there's no king in Israel or Judah named Lemuel. We don't find them in the Kings or the Chronicles anywhere like that. But some scholars have suggested, uh, because Lemuel literally means devoted to God, that it may have been a pen name for Solomon. Others believe that this particular chapter was written after Solomon because of some of the characteristics of the words. Some think maybe it was a foreign king and it's a pen name for the author. Several older commentators and Jewish legends say that uh, Lemuel was Solomon and his mother was Bathsheba. And in the book of Kings, we find that God had given uh, Solomon a very special name too. He called him Jedediah, which means beloved of the Lord. Funny, he never uses the name after he gives it to him. He actually sent the prophet Nathan to David and Bathsheba and said, name him this, I love him. Tell him I love him, but he, he continues to call him Solomon. So his mother may have called him Lemuel as a pet name. Lemuel has a lot of meanings. It can mean with God or unto God or lent to God. Could mean set aside, set apart, or dedicated to God. And it is the only king that is mentioned by name in the book of Proverbs. So something unusual about this chapter. This is also the only ancient Near Eastern wisdom teaching attributed to a woman in the book of Proverbs. There's nothing else like it. So again, this may be the nickname she gave him. I don't know. Nobody knows for sure. A, a lot of people think that uh, this is Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. And one thing we notice, though, as we're reading through this, that she had a heart for her son. She cared about her son. And Solomon, if Solomon did write this, may be remembering some of the things that his mother told him. That's always a good thing I find if I remember what my mother told me because she told me good things. She told me right things. She wanted me to do right things and, and be good. So he's remembering the things. And he understood that his words were a prophecy or a revelation from God. Maybe it was the Lord that was bringing this back to his memory. But his mother may have been speaking about the selection of a wife. We're gonna get to that. But uh, knowing some of the problems that her own husband David had, she might have seen some of these um, characteristics coming up in the life of her son, and she wants to give him some warning. And I don't know that Solomon paid close attention to this instruction. You remember he ended up with 700 wives and 300 concubines. So um, you wonder, did he ever find the virtuous woman he was looking for among the thousand? Uh, it doesn't say so. We do realize, though, too, that it was these women, these other women, uh, that served strange gods were the ones that led Solomon away from his commitment to God yeah. and eventually away from the Lord, and it ended up in the dissolution of the kingdom of Israel into two kingdoms, Judah and Israel, after Solomon's death. So in verse 1 we read, the words of King Lemuel, the utterance, and, and so... Again, no king named Lemuel, but it's believed to be a nickname for somebody. And these are the things that his mother taught him. She's warning her son of the dangers of sexual immorality. And by the way, I'm going to say this again. I, I try to include this all the time. When it talks to men, when it's talking to the guys, it's talking to the girls too. You remember this book mainly was addressed to son. Solomon was saying, my son. And the first nine chapters, he's giving information to his son. But it doesn't mean that just men have those characteristics or just women have those characteristics. It's to both sides. So his mother taught him about the dangers of sexual immorality. And moms and dads try to do that too. And she starts out and says, what, my son? It's, it's an abbreviated form in the Hebrew of, of 
What am I going to say? You ever had your mother come up and say that to you? What am I going to say to you? How can I tell you this? How am I going to get through to you? How am I going to make you understand what I'm trying to tell you? That's, that's what she's saying. What, my son? And then she goes a little further with what, the son of my womb? Look, not only are you my son, I gave you birth. You probably had your parents tell you that too. <laughs> I brought you in, I can take you out. Not really, but you know, that kind of thing. What, son of my womb? What, son of my vows? Whoa, that's kind of interesting. Perhaps she had dedicated him to the Lord. That's one of the things that vows would have indicated. Uh, she spoke to him with tenderness, describing her connection in three different ways. The son, son of the womb, uh, having given birth, and the son of vows, or promises and commitments. Son of my vows generally means a child from her marriage. She took vows before she had this child. The child's not illegitimate. Remember, David and Bathsheba's first child was illegitimate. It was not a child of vows. It was a child of lust. That's what happened. And uh, they had an affair, committed adultery. David murdered Bathsheba's husband to cover up his sins. And the child from the affair only lasted a few days. Apparently, or perhaps, uh, Bathsheba began praying, Lord, if you would give me another son, I would give him to you. Sounds like the prayer of Hannah, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Remember, Hannah was so grieved she wanted a son. <coughs> Lord, if you'd give me a son, I'll <coughs> give him back to you. I'll have him serve you all the days of his life. What a, what a neat prayer. And it's also letting the son know you're connected with a vow I made to God. Mm -hmm. Part of why you're here is because I promised God something. And so when you wonder what I'm doing, it's because of what I've done. And I'm letting you know. Now, David did repent, wonderfully forgiven. But you'll notice in the life of David, things just are not the same as they used to be. There are repercussions from sin, and we see it in the world, and we see it in our own life, and we see it in the Word, too. Scripture says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he'll also reap. So if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap the flesh. The second verse could, again, indicate that Bathsheba went to prayer about this son. And, and uh, Hannah's answer was Samuel. And Hannah was saying, you're the answer to my prayers. And Bathsheba, or whoever this mother is, is saying, you're the answer to my prayers. That's how the mother felt about her child. You're the, you're the answer to my prayers. And she dedicated him to God. But she's concerned about him. And, and three times she repeats what she's saying. What can I say to you, my son? How can I put this? How can I get this across to you? She wanted to have the mind of God in the things she was uh, teaching or training her child with. And she wanted her child to have the mind of God as he grew up. So powerful influence that we see in a godly mother. Powerful influence a godly mother or a godly father can be to a child's life. Now, she begins by warning of the snare of licentiousness. She knows what she's talking about. And she wants to give her son some good advice. So she starts out and says, Give not your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. Wow, heavy indictment. Literally in the Hebrews, she's saying, Don't exhaust all your physical powers or spend all your energy on sex. Don't live for sex. There's more to life than sex. Uh, this speaks of unhealthy obsession with romance or sex, uh, which have a proper place in life but should not be the reason for living i've met so many couples when they're young and they're in love and they want to get married and they can barely wait and they're feeling those physical urges and and it's like oh man <laughs> and then they get married and it's kind of like yeah <laughs> that's good there's a place there's a proper place there's a proper time for this so the practice of sexual immorality or sexual obsessions gives away a man's strength Again, in the sense of spiritual strength, his self-respect, his self-control, his example uh, in the community, his standing in the community. And of course, again, this could be said that uh, sexual immorality and sex obsession of a woman gives away her strength as well. Both men and women need to be faithful to the Lord in regard to sex and romance, or they will give away their strength. The most of us know, and this is something that the mother is saying to the son, a woman can destroy a man. We see it through history. Most women at an early age begin to become aware that they can manipulate boys, later on men. 
just because they have certain abilities that are attractive to boys. So we have warnings in Proverbs about certain kinds of women that can lead a man astray. I have in my notes a young man because Solomon was talking to a young man, but it doesn't matter. It can happen when you're old too. So the warning remains the same. So she's trying to warn her son in his early years. Solomon was obedient to these lessons in his later years, completely disregarded it. And the sad result was that his wives turned him from the Lord. They, he gave his strength to them and they helped destroy the kingdom. Solomon wrote, you remember in Proverbs 6, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Interesting, this isn't what's being taught today, is it? Sex is not primarily about two bodies coming together. It's about two souls coming together. Remember, Adam and Eve became one. The two shall become one, we read in the book of Ephesians. You're joining together in this. In the bonds of matrimony, the two become one miraculously, spiritually, mystically, marvelously. Outside of marriage, whether it's fornication or adultery, you lose a part of your soul. You've connected to another person on a soul level. And uh, you lose a part of your soul with each encounter of sexual intimacy. If it's not in wedlock, you're throwing away a part of your soul. Don't give your strength. Don't give your vitality. Don't give a piece of your soul to someone else, to the ways that destroy kings. So the Queen Mother's counsel uh, was that it's not wise for the king to make himself dependent on women, verse 3. And then he's going to go on in verse 4 through 7, or wine. Here's a second thing to be on guard against Lemuel, his mother's warning his son. The dangers of alcohol. It's not for kings, O Lemuel, is not for kings to drink wine. Notice the repetition there again. This is urgent. Not for princes intoxicating drinks. So three warnings there. Warning against intemperance. Uh, it is unseemly or unfitting for the king to be intoxicated. We can see the folly of drinking too much. Remember Daniel chapter 5, Belteshazzar? They're having a party. And they're inebriated, thinking they're safe from the Medo-Persians who are breaking into the city. The handwriting comes on the wall, and they hadn't even expected it. So the idea is repeated again three times for emphasis. This would be particularly unbecoming for someone named dedicated to God to be drunk, right? Makes them undignified. They lose the respect of their subjects, and it dulls their judgment. Verse 5, lest they drink and forget the law. The responsibilities of the king are great, and it's essential that he not be impaired in his judgment or abilities in any way. They uh, forget what the national law decrees because their minds have been dull. They can tend to act unconstitutionally if their senses are dull. They may forget the laws of God and act in an ungodly way. Not good and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Those who are subjects to the king and the afflicted in the kingdom are looking for the king to uphold their rights, and they need him to be sober and vigilant and watchful. Drunkenness deprives a man of his use of reason, and that's the way men can distinguish between right and wrong. Now, verses 6 and 7, uh, a lot of people believe are possibly sarcastic in order to the point... Uh, of showing the uselessness of intoxication, nobody's problems are actually solved by forgetting them. You know, you've talked to some people, maybe you haven't, but I haven't. I say, why are you doing this? I drink to forget. And do you forget? No, I get sober the next day and it's all there again. So it doesn't work. But it, but it goes on and he says, give strong drink to him who is perishing. The indication here is alcohol is for dying men in misery. And again, the greatest misery would be dying without knowing the King of Kings, the one who paid for you. They don't have the Holy Spirit, so they need distilled spirits in the world. Paul tells us in Ephesians, in Ephesians, be not drunk with wine in which is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit of God. Historically, we've seen that inebriating drinks were mercifully given to condemned criminals to render them less sensible to the torture they might endure. You remember this was offered to the Lord on the cross, but he refused it. He was going to be fully cognizant of everything that's going on. 
and wine to those that are bitter of heart. Now in the New Testament, bishops are instructed not to be given to wine because it would pervert their judgment and discernment. In the Old Testament, the priests were not to be given to wine. In Leviticus, we read a law that was given that the priest, uh, when they came before the Lord, were not to have any wine. They were to completely abstain from it. We see the same thing again, Ezekiel 44. God doesn't want us serving under the influence of false stimulations. I want to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, not something else. God doesn't want us doing that. God wants us to be stimulated by his love. Paul tells us, the love of Christ constrains me. You remember Noah had this problem. There's a lot of arguments about whether he knew what was going on. Maybe it's this new earth and the, the new atmosphere. He didn't know that wine fermented or that grape juice fermented and he got drunk and he, uh, his son got cursed, Ham, and of course Ham's descendants, the Canaanites. So Lemuel's mother is saying, look, you're going to be of a king. Don't drink, be sober, be watchful so that you can give right judgment because you are the king over the people. And if you're drinking, you may not be as accurate in judgment. You might pervert judgment of the afflicted. And he who would rule a nation must first be master of himself. I think this, to me, maybe you can see it too, is an indication that our government leaders should not be given to wine and strong drink. They should keep their wits about them, especially making decisions about huge amounts of money and things that are going on in our, in our world, and the people that they affect, people in our country, and people all over the world. Yet some of the highest alcoholic consumption per capita in the United States is, guess where? Washington, D.C. There's one place that's higher. That's the, the uh, state of New Hampshire. <laughs> so, yeah, D.C. comes in second for alcohol consumption. Mm. So verse 7, let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Kind of like a medicine maybe for those who are perishing. It might help them forget. But the true remedy is for the judge of the oppressed to hear the cause and render a decision in righteousness. So the plea is for honesty, justice, and fairness. He can't render that kind of justness under the power of wine. Now her third piece of advice is defending the defenseless. Verse 8. She says, open your mouth for the speechless. Uh, in the old King James, it says for the dumb. It's not that somebody's stupid or that somebody can't talk. It's that they don't have the ability to, to defend themselves in a court of law. It's figurative for any person who can't plead their own cause. Open your mouth for those who don't have a voice. In the, case, in the cause of all who are appointed to die or protect the rights of these people who are helpless. Open your mouth. Judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and needy. The only way the judge is going to be able to judge righteously is if he's sober. So stand up for the poor and needy. Being a leader means that you have some level of control or power or position. And the question is, will you use it to indulge yourself with women and wine? Or will you use your position to protect and benefit those that you lead? Three things I want you to do. Stay away from sexual sin. It'll destroy you. Stay away from alcohol. It'll cause perversion in you. Care for people and those who are overlooked. Stand up for those who don't have a voice. And then Lemuel's mother continues on uh, about the kind of woman she wants her son to marry. The classic passage. Most of us know it as the virtuous woman. Um, some know it as the wise woman. It's kind of like a mother describing the daughter-in-law she would like to have. I know we as parents, as, my, as a father, as a dad, there was nobody that was good enough for my daughter. I, I've talked to a lot of other dads, and they pretty much feel that way too. And then your kids turn 18, and nothing you can do about it, really. So hopefully you've had good influence ahead of time. But this, this mom is expressing what she's looking for in a daughter-in-law and would like to have. Incredible list. The woman in view in this passage is, is probably no single historic individual. And throughout Proverbs, the writers describe people generally. It doesn't pick on people. They didn't usually uh, use particular individuals as examples, positive or negative. 
However, there are many biblical women who model the various descriptions that we see here. This description provides a standard of godly wisdom for women. However, I want to say that as you go through this list, this standard is not within every woman's reach because it assumes certain personality abilities, uh, personal abilities, resources that are not available to all, and it's a little bit idealistic. But I, I find it fascinating because this is a chapter that's been very popular with young men who are looking for advice on how to use, how to find a woman, how to find a godly woman. Now, and I admit, when I was young, I used to walk around with this list and compare it to people. And I did find a woman, very godly, fit this whole thing. She was about 65 at the time. And I, I, I sat down and I talked with her husband. And I said, wow, you have a virtuous wife. He goes, it takes a while for him to get there. <laughs> 63, 64, they start coming into this. Old, old doctor, interesting guy. But the virtuous wife is translated as the excellent wife in Proverbs 12. And it's a term also applied to men and translated mighty men of valor in Judges 6, 2 Kings 24, the competent men in Genesis 47, the able man in Exodus 18. So it's a, it's a separate self-contained composition. And verses 10 through 31 is an acrostic poem. We've talked about acrostics before, especially when we're in the book of Psalms. What it means is each verse, there's 22 more verses, and each of the 22 verses starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it follows, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zion, right on down the line. We've seen this before. The, the most incredible one or the most popular one is Psalm 119. Do you remember? There's 22 sections of eight. And so there's eight verses that start with Aleph, eight verses that start with Bet, eight verses, and so on that go entirely through the entire poem. The acrostics are not hidden codes, as some would think. They're a literary composition in which the writer used the letters uh, as the initial letters of the sequential verses. And this is a poetic way of saying, I've covered the whole subject from beginning to end. Or we might in English say, we've covered it from A to Z. We've hit everything. We've talked about it all. So poetic way of saying we've covered this subject in uh, uh, several portions of scripture that use this. Actually, um, Lamentations does the same thing. You remember it starts out with uh, 22 verses. Chapter 2 is 22 verses. Chapter 3 is 33 verses. And then it kind of breaks down. Chapter 4 and 5 don't follow that anymore. They're a remnant or a reminder of chapter three and the breakdown there. So she starts out, we're, we're looking here at the virtuous woman and it starts out and says, who can find a virtuous wife? Good question. <laughs> and it's the cry again of many young men today and many young women who can find a virtuous husband mm -hmm. or a godly husband or a man of valor for a husband. And the scripture teaches us, don't look at the exterior, it fades, it loses style. Mention has often been made in Proverbs of the unfaithful wife. And perhaps the compiler at the end of the book is saying, you know what? Uh, let's do something that's a tribute to women because there are godly women. And so I want to I give a tribute to the good or the ideal wife. Traditionally, this poem was read in Orthodox Jewish homes, still is today, on Shabbat evening. Maybe you've seen um, Fiddler on the Roof. You remember they're singing that song, May the Lord Bless and Keep You, and they mentioned women in the Bible that were godly women. May you be like Ruth and like Esther. And so it's an encouragement, and it sets a high standard uh, of wifehood. More valuable than anything material. Her price is far above rubies. This is a rare person. I don't know if you know this, rubies are, are very valuable. And in most places, rubies are worth more than diamonds because they are more rare. They're more costly, very precious stone. Now, a woman that's virtuous, that's serving the Lord, that has these strength is worth more than that. Her value, her worth is greater than what she does. And such a wife is more precious possession than all earthly things. So in a sense, the complete profile of the Proverbs 30 woman 
a 31 woman is an ideal goal, much as the listing of the character of that of the godly man. We see that again in uh, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. It would be rare to find a woman who excels in every aspect of the list. So it shouldn't be used to compare or condemn. Oh, you're like this or you're not like that. Uh, either one's self or another woman. Rather, the character should reflect the values and aspirations of a woman who walks in the fear of the Lord and godly wisdom. And so he goes on and he's going to talk about the relationship. The heart of her husband safely trust her. And I like that. Christian men need to remember that this is a reminder that we would walk in the fear and wisdom of God so that we might be worthy of uh, and compatible with such a virtuous woman. So 11 and 12 speaks of her relationship with her husband. The heart of her husband safely trusts her. He'll have no lack of gain. In other words, she'll not bring ruin to the husband or to the family by overspending. He has no lack of gain. She's trustworthy when it comes to financial obligations. She cares about the financial affairs of his, her husband. And the gain that's going to be mentioned here, he has no lack of gain, is by the wife's estimate. She adds to the family. She doesn't take away from it. The guy leaves for work. He's not worried about what his wife's doing. Is she selling everything in the house? Is she hanging out with a mailman? Is she at the mall spending my money? He doesn't worry about it. He trusts her. Now, I've always reflected this. I've looked for something that ministers to me, and I've taken the name wife or woman out and replaced it with bride. We're the bride of Christ, right? So as Christ's bride, can he trust me with everything? Am I going to lose anything? Am I going to misuse the things that he's given me? Can he safely trust me? Uh, does he have to wonder where I'm going or what I'm doing or how I'm acting or what I'm thinking and how I'm using the resources? Verse 12, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life, or literally in the Hebrew again, till the end of her life. Is this how we are towards the Lord? Am I going to do good for the Lord all the days of my life? Do I ever do anything evil? Do I ever do things that might reproach the Lord or cause other people to blaspheme? That would cause people to turn away or be stumbled? She's going to do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Then verses 13 through 16 talks about her work. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. Now, wool and flax were the high quality materials in ancient Middle East. She's not afraid to get her hands dirty or calloused. She's not too good to do that kind of work. She's not above that kind of work. I hire other people to do this work. I'm not, I'm not one to ruin my nails. <laughs> this is a, a, a labor of pleasure and a labor of love. And I think we should be willing to work with our hands for the Lord. Whatever he calls us to do, be willing to work. I, I find it that way with my kids. As they were growing up, and even today, there's things that I will do for my children and grandchildren that I don't want to do for anybody else. Let's just start with changing diapers. <laughs> Not fun, but I will do it for my kids. I will do it for my grandchildren. Why? Because I love them. And this is what God is talking about. Uh, may the Lord give us that kind of love for each other. She's like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. I get a picture in my mind of this woman. It's less common today because we've got the internet, but she's driving from store to store. She's collecting coupons. She's looking for the best deals. She doesn't shop at 7-Eleven or someplace like that. She's going to go to Food for Less. She wants to be sure that she gets not only the best deals, but can bring home more food than she would without shopping like that. Getting the bargains, uh, best quality, and she brings home more groceries because of that. She also rises while it's yet night, if necessary, and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservant. This woman, and again, I said some of this is beyond your abilities. Maybe you don't have hired servants or something like that, but she wants to make sure that everybody in the family, everybody that their family is concerned with, is taken care of. She doesn't sleep in. And I think it's only real love that could cause a person to do something like that. A woman that gets up at five in the morning to fix her husband breakfast before he goes off to work and 
Uh, I think she can only do that out of love. If she doesn't love him, then it becomes drudgery. Then it becomes a drag. And she's going to mumble and complain. I like this verse especially because I think back on my own mother. I never remember her being in bed or asleep when I got up. She was always up before me. She was the one that was waking me up. She was the one that was making sure that I, I had breakfast. She was the one that making sure I'm getting off to school. And, oh, I had to make my bed and everything else too, you know. She made sure that my socks matched. She made sure that I had a lunch packed. She was there to make sure that everything was together before I left. But she was always up and she was always ready. And I think my mom is very close to this description. Now, not only that, in verse 16, it says she considers a field, literally examines the value and buys it. She's adding to the family estate and with the fruit of her hands, money accumulated by her management, she plants a vineyard. Uh, she considers the field and buys it. From her profits, she plants the vineyard. Now this woman is industrious, financially astute. Not only does she not drain her husband's finances, she goes out looking for ways to add to them. She, she saved up extra money. She's gone out and purchased a piece of land and planted a garden. Literally, uh, it says vineyard here. If you look at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 2, verse two the Lord talks about planting a vineyard. It's a lot of work. But she does that work for her family. And then not only that, the next section, verses 17 through 20, show her strength and compassion. Now, I know you're so excited about this, you don't want to stop, but I'm going to stop here tonight because this is the middle of the passage. And if I, if I were to finish, it would be more than 20 minutes, okay? So we're going to save the end of the book till next week. Mm -hmm.